Welcome to Entrepreneurs Podcast, the podcast for developpreneurs, the podcast where you get to be a fly on the wall listening to real conversations of three developers trying to tackle the challenges they face as entrepreneurs. All right, we're live. And I'm here for once. Yay. All right. <laughs> yes. Wait, who are you? Yeah, I'm new here. Hi, my name is Derek, and uh, I play YouTube games. The good news is we found those guys that kidnapped Derek in that black van because he uh, <laughs> knows. While we were in Vegas, we made a site and uh, we got uh, got Derek out. Yes, those those people that kidnapped me and tried to take me to Vegas, and I fought my way out. And... <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, um, I guess I'll uh, give an update since I haven't been here in like 12 years. Um, where to start? So I guess uh, first off, um, if anybody out there is looking for some consulting or training work around Docker and Node.js. Moby. And yeah, Moby. No, not Moby. Um, <laughs> Docker is now Moby, isn't it? No, D Docker, M Moby, from, from what I can tell, Moby is Docker's attempt at saying um, the the operating system is your problem, not mine. Oh, okay, okay. Um, the, the host operating system is your problem, not mine. But, uh, yeah, so if anybody's looking for some consulting or training work around Docker or no J and Node.js specifically and possibly microservices with RabbitMQ in the mix, let me know. Because my client that I supposedly had hours with again is refusing to um, approve the hours that I've requested to do the work that that they need done. So to that client, I need new clients. Um, I'm specifically <laughs> looking for. Done, but yeah. they don't want you to spend any time and bill them for the work. Exactly. Jesus. It's it's the bureaucrat that I report through. That that is literally what it is. The bureaucrat that I report through will not approve the hours without his boss approving it. But the guy that the the bureaucrat doesn't know he, he doesn't understand what I do or why it's important in spite of repeated conversations with him <laughs> from from me and from the team that I work with telling him how critical the stuff that I do is. You you need to you need like our to rent a Ron Swanson. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would, if if Ron Swanson could hire me, just just pay me my hourly rate to, to show up, <laughs> and and you know uh, that that'd be fine. I'd be I'd be happy with that. Hey Derek, if only you had a way to to, to, to communicate with maybe ten to twelve thousand people. Yeah, I know. And let, if, let them if, know. <laughs> if only yeah. there were like yeah. some kind of way I could email seven thousand nine hundred and twenty people, <laughs> hmm. and then send a blast message out to about eighty two hundred people every every few hours. You know, it'd be <laughs> well. But you could, hmm. I mean, you could probably get some consulting work pretty fast. Yeah. Too. Yeah. yeah. So I've I've literally asked in two places so far: Slack and here. And uh, the the Slack stuff, you know, it, it was a big group of, of entrepreneurial people. What didn't really expect a response, but I, I made the decision basically two days ago, and I need to get past the current launch sequence and webinar that I'm doing right now, and then I'm going to be reaching out to my mailing list. Oh, that's cool. To, yep. to see, because, but speaking of my my launch sequence, um, fifteen emails for the for the launch sequence <laughs> in this webinar. Is that too not many? Enough. <laughs> it's not enough. <laughs> no, but it's it's been it's been really good information. So I, I did things a little differently this time, and I'll, I'll tell you where the big fuck up was this time, um, as as well, because it is literally impossible for a marketing campaign to go smoothly. It is just guaranteed <laughs> something will go completely wrong. But I, I did things differently this time. I started out by sending out a one question survey to my mailing list. Okay. And I got about 45 responses to that, which is pretty nice. So are you doing the Jeff Walker thing? Yeah, I'm trying that. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm doing a – honestly, the only real difference between what, what Jeff Walker's launch, product launch formula is and, and what I've always done is sending out that survey at the beginning and then using that 
as fodder for the first round of information. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it's pretty much everything that I've that that you guys have taught me over the last few years that we've always yeah. done. I think actually Jeff Jeff originated most of that. Okay, and then t taught it to so many people that now it's just sort of what everyone does. And right, right. So you're actually circling back around to the source and going, "Hey, I yeah. know all this." But, yeah, I'm going, "Hey, I know mm -hmm. all this," but it's it was good to see it in in concrete steps. The the one thing I'll say before I, I talk about my launch is. I absolutely hate Jeff Walker's launch book, but I highly recommend reading it. <laughs> okay. So I hate it because it is 80% him marketing himself and his product launch formula program. Um, it's, yeah. it's basically just, it's, it's, it's 14 chapters of him marketing himself. And within those 14 chapters, there are three chapters that will give you a single high level overview of the steps you need to take in Dan order Kennedy, to, to do. Dan Kennedy calls that the, the 250 page sales letter. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> I it love it. <laughs> but it's, it was, if, if you're, if you're a person who has never built a mailing list, never done a real product launch, then there's, there is legitimately a lot of good information in here. You just have to kind of skip past, the case study that he puts on every other page. Yeah. Um, but, but beyond that, um, I'm, I, I made the change in my launch to, to use his one question survey at the very beginning, which produced a lot of resp responses, more than I expected, which was good. So I took those 45 responses and crafted those into um, a sequence of four emails uh, to launch uh, as the pre-launch basically. Um, building up to the actual product launch. Uh, so those four emails are done as of this morning. I announced the actual webinar this morning to my mailing list. On Sunday, I'll be sending out the FAQ about the, the, the webinar. And then on Monday, um, registration for the webinar opens up. Been getting some pretty good responses from the content this week. I've had several people email me saying, hey, this is so great. Thank you so much. I've been wondering about this, and I looked into that, and I didn't know what it meant, and this really helped me. And So lot, lots of good responses like that that I'm, I'm tracking in my testimonials folder. Um, Monday morning will be the launch. I'm giving my most of my mailing list, like 99% of my mailing list, a 40% off discount code, so they'll get the webinar for 29 bucks, And then... Um, the, the people that have previously attended a webinar will get the 60% off discount code so they can get in for 19 bucks. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that this works out well. The, the big thing that I screwed up this time, just to follow back around to that, um, if you're trying to plan two weeks worth of email sequence, you know, one week of build up, one week of, of launch emails, Make sure you start it two weeks before the webinar actually goes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It's not, not one week. Not the week before. Because <laughs> that makes it difficult to do two weeks of yeah. a week of build up, a week of launch. And, and yeah. So I last Friday actually, uh, when when you guys were in Vegas or coming back or whatever. Um uh, no, 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 this was Monday. I take that back. This was Monday morning. I'm scheduling my next email in Drip, and they have some screwy UI bug where their scheduling pops up in the top right-hand corner now. Um, but I, but because of that UI bug, it, it threw me off of my my patterns and my habits, and I had to go look. And when I looked, I realized, oh crap, I'm <laughs> scheduling this, you know, email that says the cart opens Monday for Friday before the webinar itself actually launches <laughs> I actually is actually live not not a week nice. before nice yeah that, that's actually a new so panic rip that yeah due to the partnership with lead pages now they have that, that new feature to help you yeah, the, the avoid UI scheduling box. glitches yeah exactly so so yeah so moment <laughs> of panic um, I, I I hopped into a, a Skype call with uh, a couple of guys from my other Slack and basically exploded on them and asked <laughs> them to talk me off the ledge that I was about to jump off. 
because I was seriously considering cramming all of those emails into the next, you know, into this week in order to get it done. So the webinar could still be next week. And they, they helped me realize that I had never actually told anyone what the date of the webinar was. <laughs> that was my question, yeah. So so that was an easy fix. I just pushed the <laughs> webinar out a week. Like, All right, nice. panic averted, problem nice. solved. I think this launch sequence is going really well. I'm you know uh, very curious to see the the end result of how many registrations I get next week. That's going to be kind of the the big important thing. If it works well enough, I'm going to use this entire two-week launch sequence as an evergreen funnel mm -hmm. to get uh, people into um, in, into my my sequence and into buying something. Uh, but the the unique thing about this for for me in my mishmash of of audience, um, the webinar is all about learning JavaScript ES 2017 mm -hmm. and beyond inside of Docker so that you don't have to worry about breaking any of your existing projects. Mm -hmm. So this this is like a, a perfect overlap between both of the audiences that I have. So I'm, I'm hoping that this sales sequence works well enough because I think it would be a really good way for me to turn JavaScript developers into Docker developers, at which point I can follow up with more, here's how to learn Docker, you know, here's how to mm -hmm. get the details, here's the Node.js side of things all that kind of stuff. Um, and as one of the bonuses at, uh, of, of this particular webinar, I'm actually giving people seven screencasts from my Learn Docker series, or, or my Learn Docker guide. I'm giving people the, um, the installation and management episodes um, as, a, as a free bonus, because I'm basically, I'm, I'm telling everybody in the launch sequence and in the sales page that yes, you're gonna use Docker for this, but no, you don't need to use Docker. I've done all of the Docker work for you. All you need to know mm -hmm. are these, you know, three or four simple little commands that I'm going to give you, and you'll be able to do everything inside of Docker without having to worry about Docker. Nice. But then once people are doing that, you know, that's the that's the done for you solution. Once people are doing it, though, they're going to be curious. They're going to want to know more. They're going to want to get into Docker a little bit more and learn more about it. And that's where I'm going to follow up with. The, the additional emails about my Docker courses. Cool. Sweet. So that's that's hopefully going pretty well. So yeah, that was those were the, the the two major things basically summarizing my last month, just working on that sales sequence. I wrote twenty two hundred words in three emails yesterday for this <laughs> launch sequence. There's a lot of words. I haven't added up all of it, but there's there's probably so there's there's a total of 15 emails, about five of which are just really short ones. Um, well, not f yeah, four or five of them are, are really short ones. So close to 10 full length, you know, 600 to 800 word emails, plus 2,000 word blog posts that came out of those emails. <laughs> so yeah. two of the emails that I sent this week were were basically um, continuation of the story in in about three four hundred words. And then link to the blog post that came out of uh, what I was originally writing. So that drove traffic to my blog, which got people onto my mailing list, which got more people into the sales funnel. So it's you know, good things all around, I think. We'll see how the actual launch goes Monday morning and with all the emails next week. I still have one more email to write. Um, it's, it's kind of the, the, the summarizing everything that you've learned and everything that I'm going to teach you, like the last day before the the, the launch sequence ends, and then there's the, the the two or three you know last day last chance kind of emails I need to to write. But it, it's probably you know with ten emails averaging five hundred words, six hundred words per per email, you know six thousand five to six thousand words plus the two blog posts. <laughs> it's, it's been I've put you know, a solid two weeks of effort into the launch sequence in writing yeah. alone, plus almost a week of effort, well, probably half a week of effort into the sales page, which is probably, you know, 4,000 words itself. <laughs> and I haven't even built the freaking webinar yet. I, I haven't, <laughs> I, I know what I'm going to do in the webinar. I know how to do everything that I've promised already. That's not the issue. The issue is that I haven't actually sat down to write my webinar script yet. 
Mark, so, marketing is way harder than building the product. Yeah, holy it? crap, it is. That's why when <laughs> Ten people times come to more work. product ideas and they're like, I have a genius idea and I'm like, uh, that it Show doesn't the sales. <laughs> <laughs> Show the yep. sales. Do you know how to market? <laughs> All right. So so the, the last thing I guess there is one other thing that I that I almost forgot about. Um, I am looking for somebody that wants to get into info products in terms of building them and marketing and selling them to become an intern for me. I'll pay you an hourly fee, a small hourly fee because I don't have much money right now, but I need somebody that is a developer that knows how to edit video in screen ScreenFlow specifically. You got to be on a Mac because I can't keep editing my own videos and doing the, the manual formatting of my transcriptions and everything else. I've, I've spent two solid days this week editing one video and one transcript for an interview for my Docker series of interviews. And it's, it's destroying my ability to get any other work done. So if anybody out there watching this, I'm going to email my list about this as well eventually. But if anybody out there is watching this and you are looking to get into info product sales and marketing and are willing to edit and know how to already know how to edit video with ScreenFlow, and do you know transcript formatting and PDF generation and stuff like that? You get in touch with me because I need help. I'll pay you an hourly rate, but mostly a, a small hourly hourly rate. But mostly, consider yourself an intern learning how to do this stuff so you can build your own little empire. All right. So, jo so Derek is looking for a job and looking to hire someone for a job. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I need a job. Somebody come work for me. It's, that is the truth. Oh man, that is the truth. I, I, I I've uh, hired a bunch of people, and I feel like I work for them. Yes. <laughs> oh wait, that's not what you're saying. <laughs> nice. Uh, By the way, I feel like I need to shave my head now because, like, John shaved his beard and got a haircut, and Chuck's Chuck's all clean shaven again. Yeah. No, you and me, Josh. We'll be the scruffy ones. <laughs> you missed the uh, you missed the partying in Vegas, Derek. Next I year. know. Yeah. I seriously like had a moment of fuck everything. I hate the world. I'm gonna quit when I saw you guys actually starting up the live stream from from Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> I was so pissed off that I wasn't there. It's alright. But I watched the live stream anyways, and it was really good. I was actually I'm actually really glad I watched that live stream. Yeah, the best part was when somebody put their finger over the mic. Yes, that was amazing. <laughs> We're very glad you watched, Derek, because otherwise the second half of the show would have been you know, we wouldn't silent. Have yep. It would have been a Charlie an, Chaplin yeah. movie. I bought an eye ring now. It it like nice. lifts the ship. Oh, it, cool. It, it like hooks up to the back of your iPhone and then you the... put your finger in it. And so oh, you there you device. go. So that that oh, would have made it harder for the homeless people to rip the phone out of my hand when we were exactly on <laughs> Walking along the highway, John. Yeah. <laughs> so I had an interesting week this last week. Um, first of all, I canceled Freelance Remote Conf. Um, wow. Yeah, I only had six people registered at the end of the, not last week, the week before last. I guess it would have been this week. So yeah, end of last week. Yeah. I was like, bag it. You know, I'm, I'm just not going to scramble for this. Um, and then I lowered... I think I talked about this last week, but I lowered the prices on the conferences uh, for newbie and Ruby remote comps. Um, and then I had a long talk with uh, Joe Colantonio, who's oh, yeah. one of the other um, entrepreneur programmers groups. And I, I, it's funny we were talking. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, the way you do it makes sense. The way I do it's kind of dumb. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, so I guess what he does is he surveys the people on his list before he puts out the um, the conference, and then um, he just invites people that he knows. Because I know people in the you know like the the conference after newbies is Angular. I know right. tons of people in the Angular community. So yeah, if people are telling me we want to learn these particular things. Yeah, why put out a call for proposals and shuffle through all those talks? Why not just go to the people I know who will do a great job and say, hey, you want to come? <laughs> you want to come talk about this? Yeah. So uh, watch I mean, it, watch it, Chuck. The, that's a good. That's the good old boy system. 
of of selecting <laughs> people for conferences. You might, you know, people might not like that. I know, right? I, I I have so much privilege that I'm I'm giving privilege to other privileged people. Oh man, I know that's oh, right. White though. privilege. So we still double check. I'll I'll still associate with you for now. I'll, I don't know if I will. <laughs> I know, right? Call the ACLU. Anyway, so um, anyway, um, yeah. So that that's what I'm going to do for the Angular conference. It's funny because uh, Grace just finished reaching out to people. Will you submit a talk for Angular Remote Comp? And <laughs> I'll look at those if I have to. <laughs> anyway, I'm just sitting here going that that makes so much more sense. Yeah, that um, makes sense. And you're going to get is. a better response rate reaching out to those people and yeah, yeah and not asking them to submit a talk, just asking them to talk about something. Yeah. yeah. Well, the other thing is, is that um, he had, you know, like 10 times more people show up to his conference than my conferences. And I'm sitting there going, I'm like, you know, what are you doing different? Well, he's doing everything different. That's what. <laughs> <Yeah>. Well, <laughs> one, one big thing to do is, okay, so his niche is test automation, okay? Right. Which is it, it's a, it's a huge, very popular niche. It's very difficult to find mm -hmm. information on this, right? Yeah. And he's got his podcast is that everything is that his sponsors, right? They have right. big lists there. Like it's it's a very very focused and defined niche. So like that's what that's what. And I, I keep telling him to quit his job. He won't do it. But but because like, he thinks it's a fluke. But but I'm I'm telling him like this it's is the fluke. niche. Not a fluke. If I were to yeah. pick any niche in software development to go into. To make the most money, it would be test automation. Like Absolutely, that, that is Cody, like Cody's got fifty competitors, John. <laughs> <laughs> but but and, nobody else has the audience, though. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. he's got the audience number one. He's got so the like head, head start. So, yeah. So part of the reason, like he, no matter what he's gonna do, he's gonna hit home runs left and right, just because his audience is so in tuned. He's the only one providing like that that level of content. Like so, so I think there's a little bit of a. I mean, yes, he's he's smart and he's using good tactics. But but he's also like he just mm -hmm. focused on that one thing. So I think it's a little bit of a different 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 game there, and that's why he, he's able to like yeah. pull so yeah. many people. Yeah, he's got he's got one list. Yeah, we, we talked about this a little bit in Slack, and I was saying basically the same thing, John. But yeah, he um he's got one list that's like focused around that one topic, and these people are starving for information because there's not a lot out there. Um, versus like you you know. A broader topic like JavaScript or Angular, um, there's a lot more. Yeah, you know, there's a lot okay, more yeah. available. Yeah, people in the testing community are rabid about testing as well. Joe mentioned Ministry of Test in the Slack, and I'm I'm in another Slack with the people that run Ministry of Test, and they have fans that literally get Ministry of Test tattoos. <laughs> Oh wow! <laughs> that's, okay, that's, that's that that is how raving challenge accepted, John. Badly <laughs> oh, passionate. I don't mess with those guys. Those guys are like hell's angels. Okay, yeah. what yeah. happened? I did a YouTube <laughs> video and I said, "What is the future of manual testing?" And I basically said, "Manual testing is crap. Automated testing <laughs> is the future." Oh my God! Someone from Ministry of Tests saw that they posted on the forum. Fifteen people came into the YouTube channel and told me that I was a, a steroided <laughs> idiot. Right. It was like I, I had to like I, I was almost calling the FBI to put me on the on the, the you know, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was like, fuck, never messing with those guys ever again. Yeah, they they, they have the most passionate fan base. They're literally a gang. Seen. They're literally a gang. <laughs> well, the tattoos make a lot of sense in that yeah. context. Yeah. They, they're they're some amazing people though i mean they, they yeah they, they, they are pretty cool people though like i did yeah. i did have some chats with them afterwards and like you know they're you know like what? yeah there's this so. is interesting so so one thing about that is um so one of the one of the key ingredients for a really successful like enthusiastic community like that is um people violence. that have oh. violence <laughs> 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 that have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder right yeah okay. and testers I, I'm gonna get in trouble. Mm. <laughs> no, the proper term is testers. Now it used to be QA. Now it's yeah. testers. I went testers? to a conference and I said QA, and they're like, "Oh, no, we're testers." So a lot of testers <laughs> have, have a I, I bit of a chip on their shoulder. They're a little bit like chiropractors, who don't get a lot of because chiropractors don't get respect, right, from right. real doctors, quote unquote. Um, 
<laughs> he had to put the quote unquote on there. He was going to get yeah. <laughs> or, just, from, or from or from no drivers. respect from real doctors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but but testers are kind of the same way, right? They kind of get they get yeah. a lot of abuse and and from from real developers, quote unquote. <laughs> so so that they have that. So he has that going for him too. I think that that makes them a more responsive yep. audience, more prone to violence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One other thing, though, I talked to Joe about. I guess he's got somebody that has helped him do a whole bunch of marketing to yeah. some of the larger mailing lists out there. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to decide how much money I should put toward that. I need to figure out what my budget looks like. If, if you can get the same level of of effort as as what he got from from his sponsor, you throw every last bit of money at that one company. Uh -huh. Because I mean, he he literally did nothing other than get that one sponsor, yeah. And then yeah. the sponsor did all of the actual marketing for him. Yeah, that's what he said. He said he, I think he said he spent a little bit on of his own money on actual like paid ads, <laughs> some Facebook ads, yeah. But yeah, for the most part, it was, um, yeah, it was just the one sponsor, and they just sponsored him being on that list for a little while. Right. And so I'm wondering if, like, for ng or for the Angular Remote Conf, if I could just find a sponsor and say, hey, look. You know, if you'll pay for me to be in a few issues of uh, NG Newsletter, yeah, or something right. Mm -hmm. Get on some oh, of the, really the, good the Peter idea. Cooper newsletters. That's a really yeah. good idea because yeah, you can basically yes, you can leverage has, the yeah. sponsor money. It's other people's money, right? Yeah, That's yeah. But really if good. it doubles my uh, mm -hmm. attendance, then I actually make more money on the sponsor yep. money than what. Mm -hmm. the sponsor Spend. Yep. Instead of giving me money, just put me in your mailing list for you know two weeks. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's an idea too. I actually reached out to NG Newsletter and just said, "Hey, is there any way that we can work something out for cross promotion?" Because I have right. I have the big um, podcast audience and they have the big mm -hmm. mailing list. Mm -hmm. right. So anyway, I, I think there's some uh, you know I'm hoping I can just work something out to either get a discount <clears> or you know it's like hey I'll talk about you you talk about me. Mm -hmm. It's good. It's and that's the best, also for tax purposes as well, mm -hmm. because no money changing hands. Yeah, exactly. Now, technically, yeah. Uncle Sam still wants to know that you've traded services, but but yeah, Uncle but if Sam, they don't report Uncle it, Sam's fucking nosy. It. <laughs> <laughs> That'll get yeah. me going on Uncle Sam. Yeah, I posted a Facebook about that, and it was funny how many people I thought I was oh, yeah. going to get yelled at, and uh, I had like two people who said something about. Oh well, thanks for contributing to people who are less fortunate. I was like, I would rather just give the money directly to the less fortunate. Yeah, um, and I saw my, your Facebook. <laughs> yeah, I was like, Chuck, I, I told my wife, I was like, Chuck basically put a Facebook post that said, "I'm rich, bitch." <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't put any real numbers in there, and I don't feel rich. All that money went into paying back taxes and stuff. But anyway, um, it was pretty funny though. Most people were just like, yeah, me too. Yeah. But anyway, um, so yeah, so that's what I'm looking at with the conferences. And then uh, yesterday I was like, I've been trying to write out what I want people to get from this course that I've been beta doing as a beta for the last few weeks. And I finally just sat down and I recorded like two hours of videos. And I said, guys, this is not nice. polished. <laughs> yeah, But this is the easiest way for me to get you the information. And then I can kind of use this, get it transcribed, et cetera, to actually, you know, flesh out the rest of the stuff. Um, so we'll see how that goes today. I have uh, the office hours calls for that this afternoon. But hey, hey, Jack, yeah. one other thing. Can I go back to the conferences? Go ahead. Thing? You might already be doing this, but um, as you're promoting these, one thing uh, you might consider doing would be, are you, are you sending people to like essentially a sales page with a buy now button? Yeah, basically, it has the speakers I, I, and the talks and the. I would say up until like a week before. Um, well, this goes in the face of the early bird thing, but I would I would have that be a, a waiting list page or like, yeah, like have people send people every like if you're especially if you're going to be doing any kind of paid advertising, like make it make it an, an uh, you know an um, an early oh, or you know a sign up page basically. It's so that. Because you'll get way more signups that way, and you'll be growing your audience. That's actually kind of a good way to get the best. Like we talked about, should you make these things completely free? Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of a good way to get the best of both worlds, right? Um, or at least get more of 
you know, more more impact. So you'd you'd be growing your list a lot more, and you know, a bunch of those people won't convert, but that's better than just having them wander off and never being able to talk to them again. That's true. And the other thing is, is I could have a kind of a capture page that says, hey, look, I'm putting together this conference and then give them that survey that's one or two questions that basically says, if we had a yeah, talk that you showed go. you how to do something, what's the thing that would pay off big time or bigly mm -hmm. if you're Donald Trump <laughs> for you, right? <laughs> yep. Nice. And Sorry. But yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. No, I like it. And then it's, it's hey, look, you know, opt into this list. And then I can take that list and I can build lookalike audiences on Facebook and I can... Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, like, you'll you'll lose, you'll potentially lose some early bird sales, but you can always, once they're on the list, you can always email them immediately yeah. and offer the early bird pricing, so... Yep. That makes sense. But I've got my, I've also got my sponsorship funnel almost finished. Sweet. Which has been kind of a pain, but... At the same time, I, the thing that I spent the most time on was that landing page that I you gave me the for, the formatting for. I just <laughs> I totally just uh, rewrote you know the relevant pieces to it. Yeah. Anyway, so that's that's pretty much together. So now I'm going to start uh, reaching out to people. I'm just gonna I'm gonna have Gerald actually go into iTunes and look at uh, my my shows, and then go to people also listen to find out who's sponsoring those and then have them reach out to those people. Just put them in nice. contextually and uh, set them up on a sequence that says, hey, if you want more info, go here or check out the press kit. Nice. Oh, um, just to change the subject real quick, quick order of business. I've been getting a lot of requests from people saying, hey, how can I find a group of people to do a mastermind? <laughs> <laughs> um, so what do you guys think about opening up one more group, like four more people and letting uh, another team come on to the entre programmers? Sounds good to me. Yeah. I've, I've been kind of thinking about that same thing recently as well. It's probably a pretty good idea. Okay. Uh, what do we need to do to make that happen? Do you have that form, Derek? We can just like, Mm -hmm. Tell people so they need to go to entreprogrammers slash dot com slash apply, I think. Entreprogrammers.com okay. slash apply. Yeah, that's it. And that'll yeah. Okay. And Let then they make sure actually yeah, okay. So there's email address. All right. So now we actually have email address in the form. <laughs> okay. And they have to pay fifty dollars <laughs> application fee, I believe. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and the instructions on doing that are in the form itself. Perfect. Okay, yeah. so they just need to go to entreprogrammers.com slash apply. So if you're listening and you <laughs> – our third advertisement of, <laughs> of the yes. Entreprogrammer <laughs> show, if you want to join a mastermind group uh, like the SEAL team or the Poodle team or Team Thunder, uh, what you need to do is go to entreprogrammers.com forward slash apply, and we're taking four people uh, for, for the group – so and it's fifty bucks. And if you don't get in, then we'll refund your fifty bucks, maybe. Yeah. No, yeah, we'll refund your fifty bucks. So but it's just to make sure you're serious. And it, and then it's yeah. fifty bucks a month, which covers the podcast and all that stuff. So yeah. cool. We also need to set up a business around this this year. I'm I was gonna look into yeah. it. Uh it'll be real simple. I think I can just file an LLC. And then we can just have sign it and have joint ownership and then mm -hmm. have a real bank account that we all have ownership over. So, yeah, we also need to get um, headshot bio and links for everybody in all of the existing teams. Yep. Cause yep. I constantly get emails and questions. Who's who in this? Like, ah, uh, yeah. So let's, we need to we get need that. To that done. Too. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we, we do, all of us, actually. <laughs> three we, years we, later. Yeah, right, three years later. <laughs> but yeah, it, it would be good to have a, you know, a, a page for each team that shows you know, who they are and what they're doing, links to their stuff, and then you can get mm -hmm. to their episodes from there. Yep. So there's some yep. work to be done on the website to, to get all this happening. So there's an intern position open. For yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it is not paid at all because we don't make any money off of entrepreneurs. But uh, there's future potential. So yes. Yep. <laughs> okay, ad number five from Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing. I have no needs. 
so we've been uh so we just hired uh native commerce the digital marketer guys to do uh content production for us nice. so i just wired them a bunch of money to do uh to do so for three months they're gonna produce a bunch of content and seo our our stuff mm -hmm. so it'll be pretty interesting yeah this so um <clears throat> We had I had a little win this week, or I guess this was a, about a month ago. I started it, but um, we have one of our most popular blog posts is is something about what is the best programming language to learn, um, or what programming language should I learn? I think it's called. So originally, I looked at it and it was ranking number it was ranking number one for what programming language should I learn first, which I think was the original title of the blog post. Oh yeah, let's and, see. If and then I um. I re yeah, you should probably check and make sure it hasn't gotten bumped down before I brag about it. But um, I looked and there was another term, which was what programming language should I learn? And that was getting like four times more search traffic. So I went in and made some very minor tweaks to the post. And Google, like this week, they bumped us up to, from number three to number one on this higher volume keyword, nice. which might be, I mean, if, if, if it sticks, it might, it'll probably be well, like. To number zero. They put yeah. us in the. We're still yeah. number three, but we're number zero. Yeah, which I but, think what I think what will happen though, John, is we'll get enough clicks. So number yeah. zero is that position that Google's introduced at the top, where like they show your like they yeah. show a question or an excerpt. It's actually better than being the top result because it's like yeah. they're showing us uh, more, an you know, excerpt. giving you more prominence. Um, so yeah, so I think what John what will happen is we'll get that click through rate on that will increase. And it'll end up probably bumping us up to number one overall. Mm -hmm. You know what Google just did, though? I just what? saw this when I searched. They put the ads above position zero again. Yeah. Yes. I, you know what? It depends on whether anyone's bidding on the the, huh. the keyword. So if there's no one bidding on the key, it's, I think it's always that way. Oh, okay. Okay. But I mean, yeah, I it just depends on it. whether anyone's bidding. But yeah. So anyway, so that was an easy win. And it should bring us, you know, it might bring us like 10,000 visitors a year huh. just from that tweak. So, so I, I, I just did a search and I'm seeing an ad overlaid on top of your content. Overlaid on top? What yeah. does that mean? Let me show you. Like in the search results? Yeah. Well, you have oh. your own cloud hosting service now, Derek? I've had that for years. It, it's um, Cloudly, and, and they just let you... I pay for Cloudly, and they let you host it on your own. Oh, are you no, saying the, the freecodecamp.com thing? Yeah. That's yeah. just... They combined their image with our text. Yeah, I don't know what the deal is with that, but yeah, they took an, they took an image from, from somebody else and put it in with our, with our content. So, yeah, I think okay. we were showing an image result yeah. and a... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're right. Yeah. But when I'm I thinking, click on that image, it goes to Google Images Search. I yeah. I'm thinking so, what I'm going to do is actually, um, I'm going to probably go back to this post and like add some... Uh, so one thing you can do is add bullet point lists, and those will, sh you cool. know, those will show up. Um, I'm going to probably add... add in, we have some videos on this, so I'll probably add in, add in some of John's YouTube videos. And just kind of beef up the post a little bit, and yeah, this could become a good long-term, long-term source of traffic. But yeah, when we met with the dig so so that was just one post, right? We met with right. the digital commerce people or the native commerce people, and they were. Like, <laughs> John was like, "All right, like, do you guys like be square with me here? Do you really think that you can help us increase our traffic?" And they were like, "We don't want to be insulting, but like." There is so much that you're not doing that like they were they were kind of the, their their attitude was a little... they, they were Perry Marshall looking at looking at you and saying, I could 10x your business in my sleep. Yeah, they, they were like basically like like me when I when I consult with somebody and they're like, Yeah, I have I have this email list of 150,000 people that I've never emailed. Did, like, do you think I could do anything with that? Um, <laughs> so they seem pretty confident that they can really yeah. help yeah. us. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, like, if we could do this across a hundred or two hundred of our, you know, blog posts, our top top blog posts, mm -hmm. and just bump our traffic, you know, yeah. twenty percent across all those blog posts, that would be huge. 
So yeah, so so it's it's fairly expensive. They wanted seven k a month for their services, but I, I negotiated wow. them down to six k a month. So um, using the tactics from that book, uh, the <laughs> never uh, split the difference. Never split exactly. The difference. Yeah. I just asked that open-ended question, like, "How can I pay this when our budget is this?" <laughs> and then they came back and and gave us the, the number that we needed yep. so, because they had to negotiate against themselves. But uh, but but <clears throat> I think it'll be worth it. I mean, I just wired them eighteen k yesterday, so that covers us for three months. And I mean, if they can do what what I think they can do, I, if they can double our traffic, it would totally be worth that, even if it takes a year to do it. But we should be able to see in three months what the, what the numbers look like. But they're gonna create mm -hmm. specifically targeted SEO traffic to, you know, to get exactly, they're gonna create infographics, things like that, Use, utilize Pinterest, which we're not utilizing at all, do a bunch of social media managing a, of our, our content. So, you know, from what they from what they promised, it looks like there's the potential to easily double the traffic, maybe even triple our traffic within a year. And if they're able to do that, then it'll it'll be totally worth that investment. Yeah. So we'll yep. see what happens. Yeah, well, like our current editorial team is really good at coming up with with content that people are that our existing audiences is, is happy to read, but. It doesn't, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't get much SEO traffic on it at all because you really have to be targeted on that and you need to be doing the key keyword research and uh, and going after, you know, specific terms that are winnable and stuff, so. Yeah, so I'm sure that <laughs> the next month and a half of my life will be basically, can I have access to this? Can I have access to that? <laughs> so but it should be fun. The other thing I, so I, I've been working on, um, so Chuck, you mentioned Contactually and the sponsorship thing. I've been working on, uh, I, I'm tr uh, trialing uh, Blue Tick, which is Mike um, Mike from Startups for the Rest of Us. Huh? Uh, he, he uh, I guess he talked to John and I think Chuck about it at Microcom. Yeah. So it's basically, it's a CRM tool that he built for managing the sponsorships doing outreach for the microconf sponsorships hmm. and um i so i i'm i it still it still has some features missing that i really want but i got the same feeling coming to this that i did going from mailchimp to drip um it was just like i was using so contactually is a is a crm tool that lets you you know build a list of people put them into automated sequences and all that stuff but it felt like MailChimp used to have like before they built their they before they improved their automation it was like you just had a list of <laughs> a list of autoresponders emails and it was they were all out of order and like you could never tell what what was going to go out when and or anything and uh, it was just a mess and that's how it actually felt like that to me like it's just very hard to see what's going to happen and everything and this tool is like super uh, it's it's like it's very easy to see the sequences and where people are in the sequences and so I, I actually had like a hour and a half long call with Mike this week and sent him a bunch of like feature requests and stuff but it's really looking cool so if you have like a high so where this would be useful would be if you have any kind of high um, high touch service business um, this a tool like this is 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 great. Uh, I think what I'm going to, like, for my mailing list, I'll probably tell people, like, use Drip on sort of the front end to get people to do the nurture. And then when people get to a certain point in the funnel, they would move over to a tool like like this. So, like, I have a, uh, somebody on my list who's got this photography consulting business, and she helps photographers consult um, or she helps, she does, like, she helps photographers set up marketing for their business. And her packages are pretty expensive. So um, with this, like she would use drip, nurture them along, and then when they hit a certain like lead score, maybe she'd move them over automatically and put them into like an outreach sequence. Right. And <clears throat> it's really cool because what I wanted was I wanted to basically the tool to do to automate the outreach but not completely 
put it on autopilot. So I have it set up so that I have to go in and manually approve all the emails before they go out. So that way it's not like if somebody's, if, I, if I've already like contacted someone outside of the, the normal sequence, um, it's not going to just like start hitting them with these automated emails that seem really weird. Like we're already, you know, we're we're already scheduled, or we're you know we're we're already um, you know moving towards them paying us, and now I'm saying, hey, we should get on the phone and talk, you know, that kind of thing. So it's yeah, it's it's a really it's it's a really cool tool, and um, I've I, I've got it set up now so that. I can connect with people on LinkedIn as like a cold outreach and then pop them in here and it'll try to get a conversation going automatically for me. So it hooks into LinkedIn? No, I have to do that part manually. So okay. LinkedIn does not hook into anything. <laughs> they have their own CRM tool. So they like basically two, about two years ago, they completely disabled their, their API and went very... Yeah, Dork. they're very anti-automation. Like they don't let you automate anything. So yeah, pain in the butt. But but yeah, I could have an I could have a a VA do research on LinkedIn, um, and then connect with people, and then when they accept, drop them into Blue Tick, and it would automatically do the the outreach steps for me. So one thing that I'm wondering then is. Because I like to automate this, like I just hand it off to Gerald. Um, he's been doing a whole lot of stuff for me on Twitter, and I think I'm going to have him change gears here soon. He got me to forty thousand followers on LinkedIn or on Twitter, and then I said him t said to him, "Okay, now go unfollow everyone." He's like, "Really?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, so yeah, it'd be nice to have him basically go through those steps, like I was saying before. You know, where you go look at people who listen to my show, listen to these shows. Right and find their people, but I found the emailing press at, or media at, or whatever at, yeah. whatever, that works on occasion, but not very often. Mm -hmm. And so I like the idea of connecting on LinkedIn. Are you just gonna give your VA like your login credentials for LinkedIn and just tell them to go do it? Yeah, actually, he already has them. So, cause he's, he schedules a post for me every week. Oh. So. Yeah, makes sense. And then you just have them keep a list somewhere then of the companies that you're reaching out to. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, what I want Mike to build, I don't know if Mike listens to the show, but this show maybe this show will now become the the uh, the back channel feature requests for Blue Ticket in addition just like, to just like just like we boosted drip to fame. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. now we take <laughs> Blue Tick. Exactly. <laughs> um, but what I really want him to build, and we talked about this, was is like a um. So right now he, it's very it's set up so that it's all based around individual contacts. So like you know I find out who's who's the marketing director at uh, Redgate Software, and I reach out to them. Well, what I want is I want to be able to pull a list of 20 people who work in marketing at Redgate and then drop all them in and say, connect me to this company, right? So it starts cycling through that list of people and working on them one at a time, basically putting them, in, each of them in turn, into the, 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 the connect, you know, like the, the sequence to try to get them to respond to me. Mm -hmm. And then right. that way, because, because, um, I can you can do that manually, um, but there there's about 15 people at Redgate. I, I'm trying to connect to Redgate right now, and there's about 15 people that might be able to tell me who the right person is to talk to about sponsorships. And uh, so what I want is to be able to just say, okay, all these people work at this company. Try each of them in turn and, and see, you know, and eventually we'll get to somebody that replies to me. So Mike really liked that idea. So we'll see if it, it ends up getting built. But you're going to become the customer that demands features but doesn't buy. <laughs> no, we've, I've already paid. I've already paid him money. So oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, because he doesn't have a free trial, so it kind right. of forces the issue. But yeah, uh, yeah. No, I sent him. So we we talked for an hour and a half, and I told him all the stuff I wanted, and then right. I sent him a, a twenty minute video where I walked through how I'm using Contactually. And all the stuff I want from Contactually in, mm -hmm. into Blue Tick, and then I used it yesterday, and I sent him another long email with like another half dozen feature requests. So nice. 
<sighs> yep, I'm that customer. <laughs> nice. Well, he he's probably looking for that kind of feedback at this point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, most yeah. of the stuff I want, he's already got open. Yeah, open uh, tickets for. So. Yep. Cool. So I should look at Blue Tick. Well, so the one thing, so they are planning to add the multi, um, the multi-user support. Yeah, that's um, kind of important to me. Because you want to be able to, you want to be able to reach out to. You want to be able to send this send from different addresses, right? That's a big big part of it. Uh huh. Is it is it so important to you to to know, to restrict access? Um, or? not necessarily. I, it was in contextually because imported everything. Oh, okay. So they imported like all of my neighbors and yeah. buddies from high school. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> no. I know the contextually. It's terrible. They automatically import. So, like. Thousands and thousands of email addresses from you. They, you have they force you to connect it to Gmail, <laughs> and then they import everyone who you've ever talked to. And there's no way to like say, skip this person. To, like don't add them. You have to you have to create like an ignore label. Uh huh. And like that's what I did was I I put people into this ignore bucket. But um, no. So actually with um with Blue Tick you can add, you can um, connect multiple email accounts. So you can send, I think you can send mail from multiple accounts. Um, so it looks like, it would look like it would coming from your VA, but you can't have multi-user login. So Oh, yet. that's fine. But they're planning on building that. And no, that would they be don't, fine, because initially when we set up 17 hats, it... Okay. Yeah, and they don't, um, they don't automatically import everyone you've ever emailed in your entire yeah. life. Yeah, see, that'd be nice if I could just pick and choose. I mean, even if I had to sit there for an hour and just say, yep, nope, yep, yep, nope, nope, yep, yep, nope, yep. I'm finding this to be, so I was I was not sure whether I was going to like it better, but contactually, the automation stuff in contactually is so scattered. Uh -huh. Like, it's very hard to see yeah. the big picture. And, like, it's kind of like, kind of like Drip was before they introduced um, workflows where you had all these, you just had one-off rules that would move people around, and it was, mm -hmm. like, impossible to visualize what was happening. Right. Um, so it's pretty, like, with um, with Blue Tick, it's very linear. Like, you can see, you know, it's you create a sequence, it's, and it's, like, a sequence is, like, a campaign in Drip. It's, like, these are the emails. Um, you can set it up so that they won't go out without approval if you want. Um, yeah, so. the... The only thing that contextually is driving me a little bit crazy on now is um, so if I send them the initial email and then maybe another email, then I'd like to send them through a nurture sequence. Mm -hmm. And Zapier is the only way I found to get some of the automation, like moving people between buckets and stuff. Okay. But the problem is, is that um, if you put somebody into a bucket, you have to set up a program in order to move them out of another bucket but it right. won't trigger multiple programs at the same time. So if they're in that bucket and they're triggered <laughs> right uh, on another program, it won't start the other program until anyway. So okay. I don't have a way to stop that nurture sequence and say, oh, okay, let's talk about sponsorships. Right. Yeah, I'm not sure if that, if, so, so yeah, I'm not sure if, if Blue Tick would allow that. It's, yeah. It might be worth playing with, but yeah. Anyway, so that's been yeah, that's been a lot of fun. I'm excited about that now. Yay. Yeah, I'll probably check it out here in the next month or something. But I finally have everything mostly together in drip or in not in drip and contextually. So I'm thinking I'm kind of leaning toward just leaving it and seeing if I can just make it work that way for a while. And I opened an issue with Contactually and said, hey, look, this is what I want to do. I want to have a trigger that will allow me to stop oh, the program they're in. They will, send you a, they will send you a reply that makes you think they're going to implement your feature, but they will not ever do it. <laughs> I've been down this road a couple of times with them. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Did any of you guys sign up for the plastic card, you know, the competitor to coin? No, mm -hmm. I didn't even hear about that. Oh, I signed up a year and a half ago or a year ago mm -hmm. and uh, they took pre-orders and they charged me like 160 bucks. I got an email yesterday that said, hey, 
uh, we didn't get the funding that we were hoping to get. <laughs> so yeah. So okay. <laughs> You're keeping your money, but you're not getting a product. Bye. Right, exactly. Wow. They didn't. They didn't like do anything to protect the pre-order. They used it for their business, like ridiculous, right? Like oh, didn't man. protect the wow. money. So, yeah. So I replied back. I was like, "Hey, fuck you! Give me my money. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care about your problems." <laughs> so, yeah. man. I'm just curious if any of you got burned by it as well. Uh, no, I had signed up for that. Um, th uh, like two years ago, there was an article about this um, keyboard, like this really tiny portable keyboard for the iPhone called the, I think it was, it was Tech, Tech Blade or Blade Tech or something, something like that. And uh, that like, uh, that, oh my gosh, it, they never, I don't know if they've ever launched that thing. Yeah. I, I ended up getting a refund on it. For, fortunately, they were they were willing to give the refund. But yeah, I waited for like over a year. Should we do uh, do thoughts? I have one more thing I want to bring up real quick. Let's um, do it. So I did reach out to a couple of folks about acquiring podcasts. And then I also, I sent out a listener email la or last week for a listener survey. And I've gotten about 150 responses, so I think that's enough for me to actually, you know, mm -hmm. give sponsors some idea of who the listening audience is. But um, interestingly enough, the two topics that people were looking for for me to start new shows on were React, not a surprise, and yeah. Elixir, which was a surprise. Hmm. So should I try and cater to my existing audiences, or should I try and find out what people in the wider world want? I mean, if your existing audiences are saying that, they probably represent a good, I mean, it's wide enough that I think it probably represents a general consensus. Uh -huh. Like, I would I would probably say you're pretty safe. I mean, it's not like you have a very specific set of people that are, right? Because you've got a lot of variety of different podcasts. Yeah. So I, I would be inclined to say, yeah, that, I mean, obviously the React makes sense. The Elixir is, is popular. You know, and I don't know if there's much resources for it. Yeah, there aren't a ton. What's the what's the goal here? Um, so my goal I've decided is, um, and I figured this out while I was um, working on the landing page. So Josh gave me the layout that they were the super simple programmers using for their sponsorship page, and uh, so I was crunching numbers to see what numbers I could put on there that would look impressive, mm -hmm. and. The across all the shows, I think they get, if I remember right, almost uh, half a million downloads per month. Okay. And I've decided that I would like to see that get to a million. So okay. I want to double my listenership by the end of the year. Is the Elixir community large enough to do that for you? It's growing quite quickly, actually. So I think it is, and I think we'd be hitting it about the same point that we hit the Ruby community with Ruby Rogues. So... Comparing Elixir and the potential growth that it has, what would be the, how much work would it be to make Elixir grow that for you versus growing your existing audience with your existing podcasts? So I'm working on some of that anyway. Um, so I'm going to be doing, I think I'm probably going to run some uh, Facebook ads and stuff to some of the more popular um, episodes and okay. then see if I can get people to subscribe and then also see if I can work something out so that it's easy for people to um, share the podcast. So I'm, I've got a few things in the fire there um, to see if I can grow it that way. But I so don't basically, know. I wonder you're, if I you're, hit... you're out of the low-hanging fruit for growing your existing podcast quickly. I think so. I mean, I can tell people to share it with their friends, right. but that's that's the way they've grown for the past five years or so. Yeah, and they're not growing as quickly as they used to. So, right. so I think you, I'm going to have to do some of these other things to get people's attention. Um, but yeah, you, you see the point of my line of questions, though. Yeah, I do. So one of the things that I have thought about is. Um, having a VA go in after each episode and uh, posting, you know, here's how you know about this, that, or the other about JavaScript and post that to like Reddit and stuff. And right. I haven't done some of that, but 
I think I'm going to exhaust that pretty fast. Yeah. It um, it definitely makes sense for you. I mean, you've got systems in place like you can spin up podcasts. Like, it, to me, it makes sense for you to keep spinning up podcasts and to continue to invest in those systems. Right. Uh-huh. That that the the better that you are at spinning up podcasts and running the production of those podcasts, um, <clears throat> the the better off you are. And and you can like it's expensive for someone else to spin up a podcast because they don't have experience because mm-hmm. they don't have so many podcasts already, but it's cheap for you to do. And so you should probably be leaning towards doing that as much as possible. And and you could get some benefit from some of the smaller, even if podcasts stay somewhat small, the long tail of just having so many of them out there. But every once in a while, one of those small podcasts like that, like you're going to hit it right and it's right. going to be a growing thing. So, And you can always mm-hmm. kill them off if, if you need to. Uh, you know, if they're real at, at some some point, but uh, to me that makes a lot of sense. Uh, plus, it's going to help you to build that system even better and build that team around around producing those those podcasts. Right. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I would I would lean towards you know just so spin them up. From from that perspective, uh, a friend of mine in in another Slack, uh, he does accounting screencasts for students in college, and he had historically only been at one really big college, and then he branched out into three or four more and started to see a little bit of success. But as he was branching out, he systematized everything. So now he's at the point where it only takes a few hours, you know, 15, 20 hours of work to stand up a new college. And most of that work is done by um, uh, outsourced intern type people. He, right. you know, he pays people, you know, VA work, I guess, is, is the, the better way to say it. But he, he pays people to do most of the work, you know, Posts all of his lessons for that school with the, on his website for that school, and he he's launched into like twenty five new schools in the last six months because exactly what of, of exactly what John was saying because it's easy for him to do yeah and he has seen tremendous success in places that he would have never considered doing before, mm-hmm. but he's also seeing that some of the schools where he was very purposely targeting and thinking about manually launching to in the past haven't really done well. Right. So it's, it's that, you know, once you have that system in place and once you can do this cheap and easy, then it becomes worthwhile to kind of just scatter shot every now and then, yeah. you know, spin up a big group of podcasts every so often, once a, once a year, once every six months, however often it is to see what sticks and see what's really going to grow your brand and your business. Chuck, that one thing sense. you can do too on these different topics, <clears throat> like Elixir is an example. So you can do some really quick just volume market, vo- volume research. So um, like for example, I was just looking at Elixir, Elixir-Lang.org, which I think is the official site. Yeah. Uh-huh. And their Alexa ranking is uh, 74,000 worldwide and 43,000 US, which is pretty high. <laughs> so they're the in the top... Uh, 40, 44,000 websites in the world. Um, you can you can also look at like top books on Amazon, see how many reviews it has and what the what the ranking is, mm-hmm. um, just overall, and compare it to things that you know. Like okay, so React, like what is the size of, or maybe I don't know, maybe Ruby would be a better direct comparison. But like the top Ruby book, what is that ranked at? Top Elixir book, what is that ranked out on Amazon? Um, how big? How active is the uh, Elixir uh, subreddit on Reddit versus like something like Ruby or something that you're familiar with. So you can just get a little bit of a benchmark so you don't jump into a swimming pool that has no water. Right. But I'm, I mean, just, just from the 10 seconds that I'm looking at Elixir, it seems like there's critical mass here. And, and since your audience is also... Interesting. One, in one other thing you can do would be um, to send... Um, Send a couple emails to your list where you use the word Elixir in the subject line. Right. And then you can kind of gauge by the open rate compared to your normal open rate, you know, how much interest there is. But right. th- I, those are just some, like, quick quick little test things you could do. But uh-huh. I don't know. This one looks, just first blush, looks, looks promising to me. The, yeah, the other thing I would say is, like, you can... Um, 
like for for example, for if you did Elixir one, contact Rob Connery. Yeah. To see if he's interested in being a host on the because then you can he's got a fairly big audience. So like mm. for some of these podcasts, yeah. it may not be the topic. It may be who you can recruit because yeah. if you can recruit people that have big audiences, then it's an automatic success. Like you're you're going to they're gonna their audience is That's gonna listen point. to their yep. podcast and they're gonna promote it for you. So you can yeah, I would I would look at that. Yep. Sounds good. How did you pull uh, Rob Connery out of your hat? Because I know who he is, but I didn't realize he was doing Elixir these days. He he hasn't been recently. He's been focused more on his um, uh, crap. His what's that? That he he wrote a book about software developers that um, feel like oh, they're right. phonies. Oh, the imposter syndrome. Yeah, imposter syndrome. He he wrote the imposter handbook or something like that, which mm -hmm. has done pretty well for him recently. But a couple of years ago, he did an Elixir Lang um, uh, uh, course. He had a really weird angle on it where he basically built a fictitious company and wrote this course as if he were this this fictitious like trucking company or something like that. It was. It was very strange to me, but it, it, it did fairly well, and he built up a, a pretty good following in the Elixir community but doing it. And then he's got a, a generally large audience to begin with. He was tech pub, was an author at Plural Sites. Um, he's he used to work at Microsoft. He's very well known and and very has a very I hate you, I love you polarizing kind of personality. So probably probably a good person to to get in into yeah. your podcast if you yeah. can. He, he used to host a podcast called This Developer's Life with Scott yeah, Hanselman. Scott Hanselman, yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. Rob is probably going to like make his own programming language one of these days. Probably. <laughs> he just seems like one of those guys because he's, he's gone from like, I love .NET, I hate .NET. Yeah. I love Ruby, I hate I Ruby. Hate I love JavaScript. JavaScript. I hate, I hate JavaScript. JavaScript. I love Elixir. Yeah. Now yeah. I'm not your programmer. He started out life as a as some kind of scientist. Like he used to go around to various places and do samples and soil readings and stuff like that. And <laughs> nice. Got into programming through that somehow. I don't I don't remember the whole story, but it's some weird, strange roundabout way like that. All right, I gotta get going. So let's do thoughts real quick. My thought for the week will be uh, come work for me. <laughs> <laughs> Number six. <laughs> uh, no, I guess my thought w for the week will be um, once again trust the process. You know, I, I keep wearing that shirt and I keep trying to use that to motivate myself. And I hate the waiting part of launch sequences. It is the most infuriating piece. Yeah. You just want to go out there and say, "Buy my shit," as loud as you can, <laughs> and, and that never works. I mean, it doesn't matter how well you you scream it. You know, it, it just doesn't work. You, you got to go through these launch sequences, and you got to have the patience, and yeah, and you, you got to trust the process because eventually, you'll find that the right mix of you know the product, the market need, the marketing material, all that kind of stuff. So I'm I'm trusting that this one will work, and if not, I will panic and be depressed and cry, and then figure out what I did wrong and fix it next time. You know, one way to cut that waiting down is to start your launch sequence only a week out. Yes. <laughs> start start your two week launch sequence one week from the from the actual <laughs> event. That's lay, lay on the floor, try not to cry, cry, cry. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, I'll I'll go kind of off of that. And I've been getting a lot of, I was just looking through YouTube comments, getting a lot of nice hatred on, on YouTube telling me to do things and, and telling me that I'm on, on steroids and all kinds of stuff. Although people say that, that those are compliments, not hatred, but <laughs> the way that people say it, it's still like, you're like, oh, you're, yeah. you're, you're stealing the credit from the work I did. But, but, uh, but anyway, the, the thought is really this, it's like, you know what? Uh, you gotta you gotta ignore what everyone says and just do what you 
think is right right mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that you never like listen to feedback it doesn't mean that you never like that you don't pay attention that you just stick your head in the sand but you got to ultimately not let other people influence what you do because they don't know shit they don't they don't they're not living your life they don't have to deal with the consequences of your of their of mm -hmm. your actions and and a lot of them are haters and a lot of them want to see you fail and even the the people that that mean well sometimes they have in their subconscious mind this thing where they want to they want to bring you down no one likes people Crabs to be more successful the then so you just got to ignore everyone ignore everyone and just fucking just do what your what your your thing is. And, Sorry, John, and, what were you saying there? I wasn't listening. <laughs> and and the thing is, like, even if even if you fail, and even if you're wrong, and even if everyone says I told you so, it's so. Would you like your choice is like, if I had the choice of being super successful but not doing what I wanted to do, what had any kind of meaning to me, and in being externally successful or being a complete total failure by everyone else's eyes but i did my thing and i i believed in it and i i ran that race i rather i rather choose the second one and and and, and the ironic thing is most of the time like when the, the people that you see that that are like you know you hear of these people all the time that have these crazy ass dreams and you're like there's no way it's not going to happen like you're you're nuts this is stupid this everyone else says this you're going against all conventional wisdom here and those people hit it big they they succeed more and bigger than anyone else is always those crazy lunatic people that will not listen to rat reason that will not listen to rational feedback and they just do their own fucking thing anyway so be that guy that's my thought it's easy for you to say john you're already successful <laughs> you were born with pets and success. so so i um i got a lot it was it was fun this week watching john negotiate that big contract <laughs> Um, so I don't know if I can condense this down. I guess I guess like be um, be willing to to negotiate on things, and it's uncomfortable. Um, like there was this one point. So John. So basically, they were like John was like, "Well, we'll pay. We're willing to do this if I'll write the check today. If you guys will lower it down to six thousand dollars a month." And they were like, <laughs> "Nah." And then John, like I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, you know, that's I guess that's it." And John's like. How how can I do this? You know, like I how can I do this when it's not? And then it was like twenty four hours of dead silence. We didn't hear a thing from them. And I was like, all right, they're they're just letting us sweat now. And John's like, no no no, they're 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 getting approval for the lower price is what's happening. And then they came back. It was a, it was about thirty six hours. They came back later, and uh, and yep, they uh, they caved. So uh, I you know, this is like. So many people don't do this in, in you know, especially salary negotiations and stuff. And it's huge. I mean, John made basically made twelve thousand dollars an hour with that email that he sent. So it's worth it. It's worth it. It's uncomfortable, but it's worth yeah. it. You have to be willing to walk away from the negotiation, though. That's the thing. Yep. That's why most people fail at negotiating salaries, is because they're not willing to walk away from the job offer. Yep. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. So my thought, um, is basically uh, I, I'm kind of going off of something that John said and it was just you know do what you want to do but also basically John got all the thoughts this week how is that <laughs> <laughs> all right full sweep <laughs> but yeah. but the same thing the, at the same time you know don't be afraid to ask for help I mean talking to Joe because he was succeeding even though he hasn't been doing this as long as I have or you know any of the million other reasons that I could let my pride get in the way um, you know, he's succeeding at, at doing the conferences. And I mean, just talking to him for about 20 minutes, we talked for about 30 or 40 minutes total, but you know, a good half or maybe more of that was just stuff where I'm sitting here having these epiphanies. Yeah. Why am I not doing it that way? Or, you know, if I did that, then I know that it's going to pay off because I'm giving people what they want. And, you know, so, you know, yeah, go out and do your own thing, be independent, but don't be afraid to ask for help either. Yep. Totally agree. All right. All right. So, um, any last minute commercials we want to squeeze in? Master or entrepreneurgroups.com yep. forward slash apply. <laughs> yes. Have your 50 bucks ready to PayPal to us. Four people only will get into this and uh, and then until we run another round. Yeah, so. basically, we'll choose the four people that we think are, are best going to fit together. Yep. Or we might just say, we decided not to have it. 
<laughs> we'll just take your money and we'll close up shop. No, no, <laughs> that one is going to cost you five hundred. Yeah. yeah. Send us five hundred, and we'll keep your money without giving you anything. Right. <laughs> All right. See you guys right. next week. Yeah. Take care. Wanna start a business, but you just know how to code. Listen to John, Josh, and Derek as we figure it out. We are the entrepreneurs, programmers, and we'll teach you straight up to be developers.